Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 20 of the Addiction Help podcast, where we talk about the latest in news, sports, and entertainment as it pertains to addiction, addiction recovery, and mental health. You guys know the drill by now. I'm Dan. That's Jessica. We have made it to episode 20, Jess. Uh, I know that may not seem like a big number to some people, but when you consider uh, where we started with that conversation you, me, and Chris had in the very beginning before we even got going uh, with the test episode, yeah. the changes we've done with our equipment and our setups and our studio space and just everything we've gone through. I feel like 20 is a pretty big accomplishment. So uh, thank you to Jess for being I'm with me for all 20. I'm, I'm proud of us too. So <laughs> uh, thank you to <laughs> Jess for, for being with me for all 20 of these episodes. Thank you to the listeners uh, and viewers for being with us for all 20 episodes. You all the real MVPs out there. Uh, and we've been we've been teasing it for weeks, and it's here, and we were not going to leave you guys hanging. We have the 20th episode special Q&A edition of the Addiction Help Podcast. So thank you to all the listeners and viewers out there who sent in your cues, and we are now going to provide you with some A's today. So Jess, uh, let's just get What's right up? into it. Uh, I know you helped compile a yes. lot of these questions, so uh, I'm going to kind of just set you up and do your thing and let you, uh, or okay. I'm going to set you up and let you do your thing today uh, because I know that you have spent <laughs> a lot of time over the years with addictionhelp.com, already putting together a lot of great resource pages on a lot I of know. these topics. I know, I can't so, believe it's years. I know. So you obviously already kind of have that information like ready to go because you've done so much great work. So uh, right out of the gate, question number one, shout out to whoever asked this question, by the way, as well. Is there a way to know before trying something that you have a high risk of being addicted to it? Um, so this is a fantastic question. And I think, you know, before I answer, I think it's also important to say like, hey, we're not here on the podcast to try to encourage you to be out there trying anything. So I want to be very delicate with this response. But the reality is people are going to people and we're not going to condemn anything uh, while also not condoning anything. So there's some important information that you do need to know before trying something. If you have a high risk of becoming addicted to it, like it's kind of a yes and no answer. If you have addiction and substance abuse in your family, you are at a higher risk of becoming addicted. It also depends on your overall mental wellness. If you already have some great coping mechanisms in place, you probably are more likely to be fine. Um, people who may not have stellar coping mechanisms or maybe are going through a difficult time in their lives at the time of trying something, you have a potentially higher risk of becoming addicted. But it also depends on the substance that you're trying. Uh, things, and we'll get into this in a little bit because of a, another question that's very similar, but certain substances are extremely addictive and some you can actually become hooked on after just the first try. So on the one hand, like, you know, technically, you know, there are ways to know if you, you as an individual are at a higher risk for addiction, but before trying something, you know, not necessarily. It's, there are so many factors that go into things especially now with fentanyl being mixed into so many different products, either intentionally or unintentionally, that you just got to be so careful. And again, you know, I'm not out here to condemn anybody. I know that the reality is people are going to experiment and do what they do. But but the other reality or on top of that reality is the fact that you just you got to be so careful nowadays, especially. So really, there's no way to know. Um, test your drugs if you are out there doing that you know i'm a i personally am a a fan of harm reduction um i know that that is a hot topic but me personally i think that's very valuable um so yeah i i just think oh that's a slippery it's hard to answer that question but we, we decided like let's just go for it you know yeah no I, i'm right there with you um once again, we, you know, we don't do this podcast because we want, we want people to go out and, you know, do harmful things to themselves. But we know that, like you said, people are people, technical terms, uh, people are people, you know, if somebody's going to do something, they're going to do it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to stop you, somebody. Uh, we, we talk about it a lot, you know, you have to want to help yourself. So 
of course, you know, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, if you're going to do something, try to do it as safely as possible. And I know that might seem like an oxymoron to abuse, to take and use recreational drugs as safely as possible, because in theory, nothing about that is safe. But yeah, if you're going to do it, obviously make sure you know what you're taking before you take it. Uh, we, we've talked, you, we've talked in previous episodes about, uh, harm reduction and the things you can do. So go back and listen to that previous episode. Um, if you haven't already, uh, one thing you mentioned too, that found particularly interesting about this question, uh, was it is, it is a unique answer to the question and that the answer is yes and no at the same time. And I know you, you touched on it a little bit, um, Technically, no. Technically, there's nothing you know you can do. You can't test something to determine if you're going to become addicted to it. But like you mentioned, there's a lot of factors out there that may be able to help you understand uh, if you have a higher likelihood. Uh, there's been a lot of advancements in the scientific community that we have been able to learn from in the addiction world as far as, you know, if you have family members that have suffered from addiction, you might be more likely to suffer as well, you know the environment you grew up in, the the people you surround yourself with, we've talked about in previous episodes or the last episode with relapse with, um, you know, the, the people you surround yourself with uh, uh, and whatnot. Yeah. So it, it all factors in. Everything you do kind of factors in. So like you mentioned, Jess, I think the best way to answer that is yes and no all at the same time. Uh, moving on to question number two, and you kind of tease this a little bit in with question number <laughs> a little, one. Yeah, it was... <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's well aligned. <laughs> what drug has the highest rate of addiction, and what drug is the easiest to get addicted to? So this is a really interesting question, and I think we both, you know, did some research before this, and because I saw like your notes, and then I researched as well. Um, it's it's not a super obvious answer. I think there there's kind of some layers, so let's get into it. First, um, the drug that has the highest rate of addiction, uh, prescription painkillers, so opioids, um, nicotine, alcohol, and um, of course, you have your your illegals, um, heroin, which are also related to prescription painkillers because they're the same type of drug, they're opiates, and cocaine. And that actually, that's the one that really surprised me. Um, these are the ones that, tend to have the highest rates of addiction, at least in the United States. We are currently in an opioid epidemic, but we have previously experienced a, an epidemic um, of cocaine addiction in the 80s. So these drugs, they, they all, they're very different, right? We have heroin um, and of course, prescription painkillers and alcohol, and those are all sedatives. Those are all going to produce sort of relaxing effects. They quiet the brain, yada, yada. And then you have um, cocaine and nicotine, and those are stimulants. And so again, they, they are going to work very differently in your brain. They all produce dopamine, which is that feel-good chemical we talk about here on the show that, that can cause or lead to addiction because you start getting really used to and enjoying that that flood of feel good chemicals, but they also, depending on why you're using these drugs, they also can cause issues with, um, gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like self, um, like self monitoring. What's like, what do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense to you? Not self monitoring, but basically like, I know somebody sitting there listening is like, I know what she's talking about. I know what that word is, but okay, well, it's that. I know. Yeah. Basically, being able to, um, like, okay, I only have, like, I'm only going to have two beers, and then you can't control, self-control. Uh, that was it. Okay, self-control. I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on a second. Yeah, okay, self yeah. It They can really impact self-control. I knew it was just an easy word in there. <laughs> so, um, as far as which drugs are the easiest to get addicted to, this is what kind of ties into the previous question, because it also really depends on you as an individual, depends on your medical history, your family history of addiction. And it can also depend on where you're at in your life. I, for example, wouldn't necessarily consider myself an addict, but during 2020, when I was just really drowning in grief, 
I very easily fell into substance abuse in a way that I had never experienced before and had never been really an issue for me before that point. So it really is going to depend on a lot of environmental factors. And also, again, some drugs are just more addictive than others. Um, The one that I did not mention on this list is barbiturate. And the reason I didn't mention it as far as having the highest rate of addiction is because it seems those numbers are shifting now as doctors are really moving away from prescribing barbiturates. That's like an antidepressant, essentially. But those are among alcohol, nicotine, heroin slash prescription painkillers and cocaine as being extremely addictive. Um, Cocaine, it's worth mentioning as well that if you've heard of crap, it's a form of cocaine. It's basically cocaine, which comes in that powder cooked with baking soda to make it like a a rock kind of a thing. And that's even more addictive than just regular cocaine. So while it can be very relative to you and your individual mental state, the drugs that we've mentioned just in this question are extremely easy to get addicted to. And that's not including like like meth, for example, it didn't even come up in the top list, but that's another one that is also so many people after the first use become addicted to it, just using it one time. So that is and to say like, stuff's addictive. Go ahead, Dan. I was going to say, and keep in mind too, that we're only talking about substances here. Obviously, there's a whole separate category of this when you factor in behavioral addictions and activities and all sorts of other true uh things that we 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 have tried to kind of shine a little bit of light on it on this show but i you know think a lot of people still when they hear addiction they just assume drugs and alcohol but obviously there are other things that are not drugs and alcohol you can also uh, become addicted to i think it's also important to kind of just go back and remind people of this as well too and as you mentioned in your answer uh really is different for every single person. Uh, Jess and I could take could be taking the exact same medication, exact same dosage at the exact same times of day, but her and I could have wildly different reactions internally uh, to that exact same medication dosage at the same time. Everything could be uniform, True. but how our chemical makeup is on the inside, you may develop an addiction issue from it, and I may just be able to go about it and it does its serves its medical purpose, but nothing bad happens to me. Or even, you know, especially when it comes to prescription medication, and anyone who has seen a prescription medication commercial on TV knows that for five minutes of that commercial, oh, it's yeah. just potential side effects. And so same thing. Jess and I could both be taking the same thing, same dosage, same time of day. She could experience some of those side effects, and I may not experience any of it. So uh, your chemical makeup really does play a major, major role in how your body reacts and handles any uh, substance, whether it be prescription or not. True. That's a great point. I mean, we even have some of us out here that have, you know, developed a, a intolerance to, to lactose and their bodies can't process that or can't process gluten. And, and those are foods. We're also talking about, you know, actual like brain altering chemicals and how our bodies break them down differently. So that's such an excellent point. I mean, even just over the counter stuff too, uh, I can tell you just in my own household, my wife, certain over the counter painkillers for my wife, you know, whether it be Tylenol or Advil or any of those, some of those just do nothing. They just do nothing to her whatsoever. It's like, there's why even bother taking them? And then me on the other hand, you know, I take an extra strength Tylenol if I've got some bad back pain and all of a sudden it's gone, you know, is, you know, pretty quickly. So Literally, food, over-the-counter medication, prescription medication, uh, illicit substances, literally anything that you put in your body, everyone is going to have a different reaction to it. And it's, and it's why yeah. addiction treatment plans are not one-size-fits-all or not cookie-cutter. They are um, individually made for each individual person and their needs because every single person uh, has different needs, requirements, reactions, you know, so... Exactly. Side note. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's a great side note. Uh, so moving right, on now to three, I'm ready. question number three. <laughs> if you know someone is addicted, but is not, but that person is not in a place to receive treatment, 
or treatment is inaccessible to them. That's important because as we talked about, certain people may live in communities where they don't have readily accessible treatment. Uh, what are other ways that you can help that person? I love this question. And this I kind question of have was a fantastic. multifaceted answer. Um, this is from my friend, Anna, and I love just, I know, I think what she was thinking that, you know, sometimes people are just not ready to accept that they have a problem. I mean, it's kind of a cliche. We talk about it, you know, in like media and stuff all the time where, you know, you've got to be ready. The first step is admitting you have a problem. You know, we've talked about intervention here on the show and that sometimes a person is not mentally in a place that they are willing to accept or receive treatment. Um, in other cases, sometimes there are not treatment centers that are accessible to the person through either financial difficulty or, you know, maybe they're a single parent that has children that can't be away from them for that amount of time. I mean, there's so many different factors. So what or even can those that you may do live, to help? Or even those that may live in more rural communities. We've talked about that in previous episodes yes. too. And it was it was highlighted a lot in that HBO documentary. Sometimes, you know, if you if you live kind of out, I don't want to say out in the middle of nowhere, but in a rural rural area where, you know, grocery yeah. stores, hospitals, you know, things like that are not Sometimes they may be 30, 40, an hour plus away from you, may not be easily available for you to just kind of hop in the car and go to a treatment center. So anyway, sorry, I wanted to just exactly. get that Especially in there. Especially on a regular basis. No, yeah, that's a great point. Excuse me. Um, so here are some things that you can do. Um, and we're going to start with the, we'll start with what you just mentioned, where if you physically don't have access or have the capability. Um there are support groups available, and many of these support groups meet online, which um, can be very helpful. And even if you don't have internet access, a lot of times your local library has internet access and will allow you to to utilize it for, you know, especially for like AA meetings, NA meetings. Um, there are even online forums. At this point, there are Reddit forums for quitting different substances that provide accountability and support tools, resources, books that you can read, things that you can do on your own, as well as uh, relying on other people for that sense of accountability and community and group success. That can be really helpful. So I, I can't say enough good things about support groups. There's um, also, now, as far there's also as, Real quick, too, because oh, you ahead. mentioned internet and online stuff. Sorry, it just this popped into my head because I've actually written a couple of these pages for uh, addictionhelp.com. Oh, yeah. uh, there are phone apps, whether you have Android or an iPhone, whatever yes. one, Google Play Store, Apple Store, uh, go check out the Addiction Help website. I have done a, a compiled a couple different web pages for different types of addictions uh, as far as uh, great phone apps. So that's the type of thing where you don't have to leave your house. Like even if you don't have... Um, yeah a home computer or access to the internet. If you have access to a smartphone, which everyone pretty much does these days, if you can get, uh, if you have enough service to make a phone call, you can launch an app. And a lot of these apps are actually 100% completely free. There are some where you can pay um, additional pay costs inside the app, uh, or you can, you can pay for additional services. A lot of them are 100% free to use at least on the most basic state. So even if you don't want to have to leave the house because you're embarrassed or ashamed or you're not in a capacity where you can leave because you're just, you know, you're taking something at the moment and you don't want to be driving, like you can pull up an app on your phone to even uh, be able to get help as well. I love that. That's an excellent point too. So like there are absolutely resources outside of having to go to a, uh, a rehab type of program. Um, other things that you can do, though, as the individual, because I, I know Anna and I, I get the sense of, of why she was probably asking, um, is she's just a very compassionate person. And is that like, you know, if somebody needs help. How, how could I position myself to help them if they're not ready for that kind of help? Like, what do you do in that case? Um, number one, you can always provide information. And I say that with the caveat <laughs> because like telling a drunk person like, I think you have a problem. Did you know that X amount of people die every year from alcohol? Like that's, that is not helpful. That's not actually providing information. Um, you know, but sometimes in conversation, and I know this from, from experience as somebody who, you know, was dealing with alcohol abuse. Um, you know, sometimes there are those moments where they're, they, the, the person who is addicted or struggling with substance abuse, you know, kind of 
and opens that door a crack a little bit and might mention something like, yeah, I should probably quit drinking so much or, you know, just little things. And those are great opportunities to, to just say, you know, I, I actually read this interesting article that said, you know, whatever, just just to provide information, whether it's from a place of concern. Like, yes, I've read that, you know, eventually people who who are um, using meth, you know, eventually it's not an if, it's a when an overdose occurs. And that just, that worries me about you. I really care about you. And just providing little bits of information helps that person to not rationalize their habit or their behavior because it reminds them of the reality of the situation. And sometimes even just providing pamphlets or website information, if it's, especially if it comes up in conversation, can be extremely helpful, apparently. And, um, you know, beyond that, I think it's also important to, to remind you to not enable that person because that's key as well. I mean, how can you help somebody? Well, let's say you're concerned about, let's use me as an example. If you were concerned about me and my drinking, maybe don't buy me, you know, like uh, a handle of vodka for like a birthday present or something. Um, that's not something that actually happened. For the record, I just, I'm coming up with a fake example. But I mean, if you're worried about a person's substance abuse, don't enable them. Don't, you know, contribute to it. Maybe don't, um, you know, if that person is living with you and you have set a boundary and said, hey, I'm not comfortable with you using in the house. If you continue to do so, we're done. That, you know, I'm either, I'm breaking up with you or I am going to find a new roommate, whatever that case is. If you set that boundary, stick to it. All of that goes under enabling. And we could give so many examples, but I think, you know, the key really, the the takeaway, don't enable that person because that doesn't help them at all. Um, A couple other things you can do is set an example just by being yourself in a sort of healthy state of mind, practicing self-care, practicing, you know, being vocal about like, oh, yes, I had this very healthy meal or I'm going to bed at a decent time, just not in a passive aggressive way, but just sharing that openly. I think sometimes it, man, when you make it sound good, you know, or when somebody makes it sound good about going to bed early or eating a good meal or taking care of themselves, it kind of reminds us out here that like, maybe I deserve that too, you know, um, And finally, the last thing I wanted to mention is, you know, take care of yourself, really, because sometimes no matter what you do or what you try, a person is just not going to be ready to accept any help or any criticism or any form of treatment at all. And they're in denial or they're in a place where that's just not something that they're willing to consider. And so you need to be prepared for that to be the reality and have decided within yourself when it's time for you to take a step back and honestly worry about yourself. And that, I understand, is extremely hard and it's much easier said than done. But that should be on your list of things to consider when you're thinking about helping the person. The reality is they are the only one that can ultimately help themselves. And a well-placed pamphlet or a great conversation or leading by example, while they can be very helpful, they're not going to do anything for a person that is just completely unwilling to look within and decide that it's time to get help. So again, keep in mind what you're willing to do and how far you're willing to go to try to be helpful. But remember that you got to take care of yourself. One uh, one thing you didn't mention there, I think that is important to just remind everyone too. And once again, we've talked about it in previous episodes. I feel like that's kind of the common ground. We've talked about a lot of the stuff in previous episodes. Um, another potential thing you can do is uh, an intervention. Once again, that is a tricky situation because it does incorporate a lot of the points that you brought up within them. Obviously, you want to make sure you come uh, to that intervention in a positive light. You don't want to be accusatory. If you set boundaries during that intervention, you need to stick with them. Uh, but an intervention is another potential thing you can do. Uh, should you want to go that route, there are interventionalists, uh, treatment professionals that can help guide you 
through the process of setting one up. Uh, should you even want to, they'll even uh, help run it for you and they'll come to wherever you want to hold it and basically play, um, drawing a blank on the term, but they'll basically be play facilitator. They'll basically be the one that like will Like a mediator. Help. Yeah, mediator, yeah, yeah. help keep everything running smoothly, help keep everything on track, help keep everyone uh, in, in as much of a positive frame of mind as you can be, obviously, uh, in a situation like that. So interventions, of course, are another great, tool that you can also use in situations like that. Uh, Jess, you've yes. written some great pages on intervention. So once again, as we've been saying, addictionhelp.com has a lot more in-depth information about a lot of the stuff we have been touching on so far today. Uh, on that note, we're going to move on to question four here. So question four, this one I thought was another uh, particularly interesting one. And this one is pertaining to yeah. the link between... Mom. Oh, that's awesome. Well, shout out to your mom once again. Um, your mom your mom came through with a great She's question the best, uh, man. last time too i believe when we did a, a q a so this one is involving the link between opioid use and dementia and specifically pertaining to older adults and so uh she actually went ahead and did some research for us too which is you know shout out to her even more because she went ahead and found some information she, i know i know in She's an like, aarp oh, article, this article and then yeah. sent the article to us so that's even better but so as she puts it here according to an aarp article that she recently read uh, and she wanted to know the validity of it because obviously the ARP, while they do pro provide fantastic information, they're not a medical outlet, so to say. So obviously, you know, you want to make sure that that is actually backed up with something going on in the medical field. So on that note, Jess, uh, what is that uh, link between opioid use and dementia in older adults? And uh, specifically, yes. do they mean long time use or an actual addiction or even could it happen? Uh, adverse reaction happen with infrequent use. So, take it away. Um, so what well, the thing that I really love about her asking this is something that I think we should all keep in mind that I wanted to touch on for this question is uh, I did some research and I did find a study. So there, the way that it works in the scientific community is science loves things that it can measure and test, right? But it can be complicated when it comes to people because there are so many variables like we just talked about. You could have two people on the exact same medication at the exact same time, very similar in structure, and it can affect them completely differently. So that's why we like to do studies and then continue to do studies and then continue to do studies. So while she recognized, ah, a study has been done. She also recognized how much validity is there? Is this an early study? Is this just one study? Is this a kind of kooky, reliable, or unreliable study? Like who actually did this research? And those are excellent questions to ask when you're looking anything up. Also, what Dan mentioned, making sure you're checking the source. And the AARP is, is not necessarily a direct medical source. Um, so I was able to find this study. It was a single study so far done, I want to say, in 2023. I have to check it. We've got it right here. Um, it looks like, and we're going to link this for you guys as well. Um, it looks like it was published in August of 2023. So this is, this is relatively new information in the scientific community. And it does suggest, yes, that um, long-term opioid use Typically, uh, these are prescription pain pills specifically, did show a slightly higher risk of dementia in patients who took them. So here is a little bit more information about the study. They had about 41, just a little over 41,000 people participating in this study. I wasn't able to see how long this study went on for, um, but they basically had, they divided it pretty much in half and they had half of the group using opioids and the other half did not need opioids and then they essentially calculated how often dementia occurred in these older individuals and it did seem to illustrate that yes the patients who were taking opioids for chronic pain again remember this is usually they're taking it as prescribed did show higher rates of dementia than those who did not. Now, what does this tell us? This is just one study. Does it mean that it's completely insignificant and means nothing? Oh, 
this is a, a great group of people, um, a, a solid, I guess, amount of people that they used as test subjects that did give us some interesting information. Now, the question is, and this, this goes for science, let's get sciencey today. Um, when you do experiments like this, you're going to want to try to see if you can replicate it. And that's one of the biggest things that I think happens when people are like, oh, studies showed this and a study showed that. And that's, I think, and this is a whole other topic, but I think that's where people start to get really confused and argumentative about, well, one study said this, but another study said the opposite. So who knows what's true? It's complicated. And one of the things we do when we are performing these types of studies and research is now let's see if we can replicate it a different set of adults with maybe uh, a different, a larger group of people. Maybe we'll do it for a longer period of time. So you have so many variables. This is just one study. It can absolutely indicate that. And that's basically what they write in findings of this study is that, hey, seems like there could be a connection here. And therefore, use caution when prescribing or taking pain medication, especially if you are an older adult and you are taking them long term, uh, particularly in this case for chronic pain. Um, so I'm very interested to see over the next few years what additional research is done. Um, this is something that just to kind of veer, oh, no, I want to veer off. No, we're not going to veer off. Um, basically, all of this to say when it comes to science and research, it is great to ask the kinds of questions that my mom essentially was asking. And it all I did, like, I'm just an average person. Yeah, I have, you know, a little bit of sort of knowledge of what I'm looking for, but I just Googled it until I found the actual study, not articles quoting the study. And it shows just right here um, exactly what the results are. Some of it's a little high level language, but you can get the kind of gist of it. And again, we're going to include this in the description so you guys know what this looks like. So all of this to say, again, it seems like there is a correlation, but we need to do more research to find out more. That seems to be the theme um, or key with everything in life. Even, even as definitively as we talk about things today, we are constantly doing, I say we like I'm the one doing it. We as a society, we as a yes, scientific community- we as a scientific community, we as an addiction community are constantly, constantly doing more and more research every day, it seems like, um, especially in this post-COVID world, to determine and have a better understanding of, of just exactly chemically and scientifically what all these substances truly are doing to our body, which is fantastic because uh, like we talked about in, that, in the those episodes we did on the HBO documentary, you know, once upon a time, it was just like, oh, hey, take this and take this and take that. And who cares what happens? Don't worry about it. Whatever happens, happens. And so yeah. we come a long way from those early days of just kind of, and yes, there's still a lot of experimentation, but I think even today, um, the experimentation is there. It's much more pointed. It's much more scientific. It's much more planned out and is providing us some absolutely, truly fantastic information. So uh, one final question today, and side note before I ask you this question, as someone who truly enjoys learning new things, and you know, we just talked about just when you think you might kind of know everything, you're, there's new studies coming out, new information avail be, being made available, and new things for you to learn. This question I particularly like because I guess you could say I had never really considered a correlation between the two things we're about to get into, so I truly didn't know anything about it because I never really put the two and two together. So this question, I particularly, particularly oh, I like love that. it allowed me to learn something new. And so that was pretty cool for me because I'm always, I'm always down to learn something new. So on that note, this question, Jess, is the final question of the episode here. And that is, can bullying cause addiction? Um, so the answer is yes. And it's, it's a definitive Yes, it can. And that's what was so surprising um, to me and was so exciting for me to right. learn about. Because like I said, it makes sense now that I've read up on it and researched it, but I would have never you know, even thought to put those two together right. until this question was asked. Right. Well, and that goes to your point, what we were just talking about. You know, As we continue to learn about 
humans and uh, how brains work and we continue to do research and conduct especially long-term research and the things that we're learning now about what is connected it's just mind-blowing sometimes um so this is another link we're going to post in either the description or the comments uh, below depending on the platform but we write about this actually on the addiction help website and there are a couple of of things that I wanted to share with you guys, starting with some statistics. So, and then I'm going to get into, okay, well, if the answer is yes, how does bullying cause addiction? So statistic number one, um, and this was research done by um, a study by the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University. Now, again, this is, this is a study. So let's Take what we've learned so far and go from there. But they found that 64%, that's more than half, of people who were bullied in middle school used drugs or alcohol by the time they graduated from high school. So these are people that were bullied as kids. Middle school is, I want to say, from about age 11 to about age 13, maybe 14 at the very end. By the time they graduated from high school, they had already used drug drugs or alcohol. Interesting. More interesting to me is that 78%, more than three quarters, right? 78% of bullying victims who used drugs or alcohol said they started using after being first bullied. And so why is that? Um, and I think I can speak as a bit of an expert on the topic of bullying. Um, I actually have diagnosed um, PTSD from a pretty severe bullying experience I had as a kid. And that, you know, I'm very hesitant to share that because I, I don't want to compare my experience to someone with PTSD from, you know, a very violent situation or people who've gone to war. And, and I think those are very different. However, brains, brains are going to brain and they're going to receive traumatic and difficult experiences in the way that they do. And make problems for us to deal with later on and one of those is bullying and okay so let's let me look at something that we have on this page so you guys can absolutely come back and read this later but I think it's key that bullying has some some really key pieces to them um bullying basically is behavior that's on purpose that is usually repetitive, it's very one-sided, and it's ongoing. So it's not just like a one-time incident. If I call Dan a, you know, a doo-doo head one time, that's not really bullying. If I uh, mean intentionally with, with the intent to cause harm, continuously and purposefully call Dan names on a regular basis, that is bullying. So I think it's you know, important that we make that very clear. And so why does that have such an impact on, on kids? Well, bullying isn't just like, Dan, you're a doo-doo head every single day. It's, it's a verbal assault, it's physical assault. It can even be sexual assault. And now with the fact that we have social media, there's cyberbullying. And like, at least when I was a kid, I could go home and it was just beginning stages of the internet we were not connected the way that we are now so right now for a lot of kids there's no escape there's no way to get away from it there's no way to shut it off it's it's everywhere and it's constant and so that level of abuse because let's call it what it is that level of abuse can be very difficult for anyone you know the things that i just described i think would be very hard to deal with on a regular basis again remember it's targeted intentional with it like the intent to be harmful it's ongoing so it keeps happening there's no way to get away from it that would be really hard as an adult <laughs> to deal with you know but if you're a kid especially in middle school particularly that is where your brain is doing some really important crucial development and so if you experience that kind of trauma during that time that teaches your brain I am unsafe, I am unworthy, and that can translate to self-destructive 
and unhealthy coping mechanisms like substance abuse. And one of the key reasons for substance abuse oftentimes is to bury or deal with those uncomfortable feelings of worthlessness, of hopelessness, of anxiety, which has absolutely been tied to childhood trauma, including bullying, like anxiety disorders. I'm talking about actually your brain being changed as a result of these things happening. So the answer is yes, a mind-blowing yes, that even as an adult having substance use disorders, there is a strong chance that if you look back in that person's childhood, they experienced some pretty serious bullying. Um, and our one of our co-founders, Chris Carberg, actually has a video posted on the bullying and addiction page that we have where he shares his own story, which I think is absolutely worth a lot. And I'm not just saying that because, you know, but like, and he, no, I'm not just saying that because he's essentially my boss. Like it is, it is fabulous video. So please go and watch. Um, yeah. Dan, thoughts on, you, now that yeah, you, you've like learned more about this. Uh, unfortunately, right now in kind of our society today as a whole, too, I think uh, two categories where we're unfortunately seeing a lot of very, very targeted bullying is uh, racially charged bullying, um, yes. religious based bullying. And then, of course, also um, bullying based on uh, sexual orientation, unfortunately, and unfortunately, very, very specifically amongst uh, the LGBTQ plus community are being um, bullied and ostracized at an increasingly disproportionately high rate, which is why, unfortunately, as well, like you mentioned, they are also suffering from substance abuse and addiction at a very disproportionately high rate. But yeah, um, bullying... In the well, sense and even those of, of us who are, you know, like neurodivergent too, yeah. like people with mental illness, especially as yeah. kids, anything that makes you stand out really is is. W once you know, again, as we've as we've evolved, and grown and learned as a society, just how actions, you know, react. People react to certain reactions. You know, I think just like you mentioned when when you and I were growing up, yeah. I mean, listen, bullying has existed probably since the dawn of the existence of time, but. I feel like when you and I were growing up, bullying was just kind of, you almost want to call it a rite of passage. Like you kind of knew, okay, I'm a sixth grader in middle school. I'm going to get picked on or bullied by the eighth graders. I get to high school. Like, I'm a freshman in high school. The seniors are going to pick on me. They're going to try to do pranks on me. They're going to, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, in our, in our kind of, <laughs> well, I say that, I say that because it, our generation, it was it was what you saw on TV and movies. Like think about all those teen comedy movies or teen movies from back when, you know, in the nineties and early two thousands, like that was just part of it. Like you got shoved in a, like the kid got, would get shoved in a locker or he'd get pushed in the, you know, locker room. I'm not saying it was okay. I'm saying that I think that unfortunately at that time, the overall view of bullying, saying, like it was normalized. As, it wasn't as extreme or severe. And unfortunately, or, Fortunately, I guess, for, fortunately and unfortunately to an extent, our generation has now gotten older where we're having kids of our own and we're understanding now just what that bully ended up doing to us that we may not have been conscious of at the time. Like you mentioned, like you actually were diagnosed with that. There are a lot of people that, you know, they may have turned to drugs or alcohol for something completely unrelated and then going through treatment or, 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 or being with a treatment professional and peeling back those curtains, they've realized, oh, wait a minute, bullying also was a big part of this. And then I feel like, so now um, it's more consciously observed. It's more, it's not as commonly put out in the meat, in, um, you know, TV and movies. It is it's actually, not, it's not expected anymore. Yeah, there are, right? and, like, and yeah it was cyber... the butt of a joke in a movie, like and shoving was, someone in yeah. a locker yeah. was like, ha ha. But like, that's actually, can be very traumatic, you know, We're and we seeing, use it yeah. as like this yeah. joke, you know, but then, yeah, to your point, it's like, okay, now we're looking at it and going, okay, but you're, you're putting a person like, in, yeah. like, that's really messed up and it's not a joke and it's not funny and it's not like it is actually harmful and damaging. So yeah, you're right. I think our generation and generations prior, it was treated like, oh, you know, it's just a rite of passage, you know, but like, it shouldn't be. It absolutely shouldn't be, and it's not right. And it. I think it was viewed in a very similar. Realizing now, like how it's affected yeah. us. 
I think it was viewed in a very similar light to like once you got to college and if you joined a fraternity or sorority and there was hazing and back then hazing was just kind of like, yeah, yeah, that's what you do. That's what you go through. And then you come out on the other side of that. You just have uh, to and suffer. And, and, and just in the same way that we're seeing bullying, uh, more tension and more seriousness being placed on bullying and anti-bullying campaigns. I think we're now also seeing that particularly in the sports world uh, when it comes to hazing. It is no longer accepted. It is not a, you can't just turn a blind eye to it and kid be kids. Uh, coaches are losing their jobs because of it. Players are getting kicked out of school because of it. Um, students are getting reprimanded. Because, so it's not okay anymore. And, and I think that it's great that we have reached a point now where we all can say as a society, this is not okay anymore. I understand that this is how it used to be, but there were a lot of things that it used to be okay. Right, that but like, it should have never been okay in the first place. Keep in mind, and we brought this up Exactly. In that HBO documentary. Coca Cola used to have cocaine in it. Back then, it used to be okay to have cocaine in your in your carbonated soda beverage. Then one day, until we realized, we realized like, oh, this is bad. That's not okay. And so we learned from it. So in the same light that Coca Cola doesn't have cocaine in it anymore, bullying and hazing is not just okay anymore. It was never really okay. Just like yeah. that was never really okay. But we now know that not only is it not okay, but it can have some really severe. But uh, here's why, and here's what it does. Yeah, and, and we have the scientific studies now to show, hey, look, if you do A, B is now going to happen, and B is a very, very bad thing if that is to happen. So, um, like I said, I, I I think because I came from that kind of final generation, you could say, of where it was just kind of like, okay, you know, it just it happens when you go to school. It happens here and there. You know, I never really thought about the unintended consequences and I guess maybe too once again I could be lucky in the fact that my bullying that happened to me when I was in school I guess I, I never reached a point in my brain chemistry where I felt like I needed to turn to other outlets that were unhealthy as well too so once again I'm an anomaly folks I guess I don't know I was able to just stop taking riddle in one day I was able to just go I don't know I mean I, yeah you know, it, I mean it just but. depends it depends once on again, the though, person. But once and it again, though, depends on the level of bullying, and that once again it ties back to an earlier question too. So there's an example of you were bullied in school. I was bullied in school. I don't know the extent of how uh, how extreme each of our bullying was, if it was the same level or not. But you had a one reaction to, it, and our founder Chris had a reaction to it, and I had a different reaction to it. So once again, everybody's different. Um, everyone reacts differently to things. And I think also it's important to note uh, once again, and I know we've talked about some previous episodes, you don't know what somebody is going through beneath the surface. So just be nice, be nice to people. You don't right. on the it surface, they can seem like they have everything to together nice. and underneath they are absolute just mess. And I, I, I can't think of a better word at the moment. I'm not judging anything and I don't want to make it sound like that. You know, it's a bad thing, but yet yeah, they are, they might seem like they're okay on the surface, and underneath they're very much not okay. And so, um, while you think that what you, know, you may I, be saying may be harmless, it could trigger something in them that could set, excuse me, set them off into a, a a spiral. I actually have a quick little story about that before we close out, and this is the silliest thing, but I think about it still to this day. I don't remember what point in my life this was, but I was really depressed and um, just having a garbage day. And gosh, this is so silly, but I was, I was at, a, I came to a four-way stop and, and there was an older gentleman that got there at the same time. And I, I don't know who had the right of way, if it was me or him, but he just looked over and he just smiled and just waved me on. And and it was a nothing. It was an, an absolute nothing gesture. It was just somebody being like, yeah, sure, go ahead. It just t cost him nothing. It was not extravagant. It was not over the top. It's something that I'm sure everybody listening has either done or seen or whatever. It was such a nothing moment. And yet I still think about it to this day because it just right in that moment, it got me like, just, just like I'm, I'm welling up just thinking about it. Just it brought you out of your funk. It was like I yeah. needed that. I needed to remember that. Gosh, you know what? As dark as it is, like somebody was nice to me, and 
And it was so small and so simple. I'll never meet that man. It was, you know, he wasn't even doing anything over the top. He didn't even like compliment me. You know, you hear these stories about somebody saying something nice. Like it was so small and it made, it stayed with me for the rest of the day. And I still remember it to this day, you know, and, and I think what a great way to, to wrap it up. You know? uh, yeah. No, that's a, a positive note at the end of some, um, not necessarily yeah. so positive topics, but once again, that's what we're here for is to dig down into the yeah. not so happy go lucky topics at all times because it's stuff that needs to be talked about and it's obviously stuff that sometimes doesn't get its proper due. So that's why that's part of the reason why we're here. That's part of what we try to accomplish here at the Addiction Health Podcast is talk about those so topics that um, I don't want to say are taboo, but are not openly discussed as often and in a way that they necessarily should be at times. So. Uh, on that note, that is going to wrap up today's show. We've gone a little bit long, but that's okay. They were all, uh, it was for a very good reason. So, uh, Good questions, you guys. Absolutely. So I've said it 19 times now. I'll say it a 20th time now. It is okay not to be okay. Uh, there are people out there that want to help you. I think we've done a really good job of conveying today all sorts of that. Because the fact that there are people out there even asking these questions means that there are people out there that want to help other people uh, as well as help themselves, which is fantastic. So thank you all for sharing those amazing questions. Um, yeah, yeah, we say it every week, but if you or a loved one is struggling uh, with substance abuse, addiction, mental health, please, please, please uh, go get the help that you need. There are people out there that want to help you. There are people that are out there, not just us, there are other people out there too that want to see you uh, be happy. Findtreatment.gov. Uh, you can find treatment options in your area on that website. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration has their toll-free helpline at 1-800-662-4357. That's 1-800-662-4357 and addictionhelp.com, of course, as well. Uh, we, we talk about every week just is, is rocking and rolling and kicking butt when it comes to creating uh, amazing resource pages over there. So thank you to everyone for listening to the first 19 and now 20 episodes of the Addiction Help Podcast. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> uh, we are super excited about the next 20 and the 20 after that and the 20 after that. And, and we're excited to see... Uh, how this show continues to evolve over time, Jess. Uh, I know you are getting ready to go on a exciting journey outside the country. So yes. um, we are going to be taking a little bit time off in the conventional sense that you know us now. Do not worry, though, over the next couple of weeks while Jess is gallivanting around Europe, Europe uh, we will still continue to be putting out some content. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, of course, we'll get right back into the normal swing of things once Jess uh, returns. And I'm sure she'll have some amazing stories from you for you all from her time overseas. So uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, have a great week. Jess, have a fantastic and safe trip. We will talk to you thank when you. you get back. And for everyone out there, I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a good, uh, have a good week, everybody.